Hi and welcome to Dark Rain True Crime Channel. I post solve true crime cases on a weekly basis, so if this is something you like, please consider subscribing to the channel. Today's case is about Daniel Laplante, a strange and creepy man, an all-round weirdo. He would gain notoriety in 1987 for being the Massachusetts hide-and-seek champion. Daniel Laplante was born in Townsend, Massachusetts, on May 16, 1970, he suffered a very abusive childhood at the hands of his violent father. He was abused both physically and mentally, and his disgusting father even forced himself upon poor Daniel. The abuse he received at home, affected every aspect of his young life, and at school he was diagnosed with dyslexia and a hyperactivity disorder. Daniel didn't have many friends throughout his school days, with most of his classmates referring to him as creepy or weird, and in his teenage years, the school referred him to a psychiatrist because of his lack of hygiene and his unkempt appearance. He would come to school unwashed and smelling really bad, sometimes wearing the same clothes for weeks at a time. The referral to the psychiatrist should have been a turning point in Daniel's life, as his mental state was deteriorating due to his troubled home life, but again, Daniel was let down by someone who was trusted to be helping him. Like his father, Daniel's psychiatrist began to abuse him in the worst possible way. This abuse went on for a year, before Daniel stopped going to the sessions. Daniel started his life of crime at the age of 13, where he would break into people's houses, and steal their valuables. But this wasn't enough for Daniel, by the time he was 15, he was breaking into people's homes purely to mess with their minds, he wouldn't take anything, he would just move things around, so people knew someone had been inside the property. In 1986, when Daniel was 16, he broke into the home of Brian Andrews, who lived there with his two daughters, Annie who was 16, and Jessica, aged 14. After seeing a photo of Annie, he took a liking to her, so took nothing of value from the Andrews house, only the telephone number from the phone. Daniel began calling the number, and began chatting with Annie and Jessica, who were around the same age as him. He told the sisters, that he had been given their phone number from a mutual friend from school, and that he was a blonde, good-looking and well-educated boy, that lived close to them. After speaking many times over the telephone, Annie became comfortable enough with Daniel to go out on a date with him one evening. When Daniel arrived at the Andrews house, to collect Annie for their date, she was shocked to discover that the blonde good-looking boy she was talking to on the phone, turned out to be the exact opposite of that. Instead, stood in front of her, was a disheveled, greasy, dark-haired boy with no attractive features whatsoever. However, Annie didn't want to hurt Daniel's feelings, so carried on as planned with their date, and let Daniel take her to the local fair. During the date, Daniel asked Annie lots of personal questions, and she revealed to him that her mother had recently passed away and she was in the care of her father as a single parent. He seemed to be more interested in how her mother died, and how much she suffered, than finding out anything about Annie's interests. Annie found Daniel and his questioning very creepy, so after an hour, she made her excuses and returned home. The pair wouldn't go on another date, and it would be months before she would unexpectedly see him again. Annie and Jessica were obviously devastated at the death of their mother, due to cancer, and as typical teenagers, they one night attempted to contact their mother by performing a seance in their basement. The seance failed to summon any messages from their dead mother, however, when the pair went to bed, they heard rhythmic knocking on their walls as they tried to sleep. The girls thought their seance was successful, and they had summoned the spirit of their mother. They spent the night, speaking with the unseen spirit, as if they were talking to their mother one last time. The girls asked the supernatural force questions, to which it responded with knocks against the wall. This carried on for a few evenings, until it became so frequent that it started disturbing the girls' sleep, and over time, items from the home started to disappear, other items would be moved from one place to another, and furniture would be moved around the room. Jessica and Annie, decided that it wasn't the spirit of their dead mother, they were in fact being haunted by a demon. The girls told their father Brian, but he believed it was the girls who were still grieving their mother, and were imagining the whole thing. However, the noises continued, and one night in January 1987, the girls heard more banging, this time, they thought it was coming from downstairs in the basement. 
The girls decided to investigate, and armed with a knife, they headed down into the basement towards the source of the noise. As they got into the basement, they were greeted with a message on the wall written in blood, saying, I'm in your room, come and find me. Annie and Jessica fled the house to a nearby neighbor's, and waited for their father to return before going back into the house. Brian, again thought it was his daughters that had wrote on the wall, and made them undergo counseling, to help them to come to terms with losing their mother. Several weeks later, the same thing happened, however, this time it was in Annie's bedroom, again a message was written on the wall, saying, I'm back, find me if you can. Again the girls fled the house to a neighbor's, who telephoned Brian to come home. This time however, Brian noticed there was further disarray in the house, plus an additional message written on Annie's bedroom wall, which said, marry me. As he searched the room, he opened up one of the built-in wardrobes, and was greeted by the sight of a young man, dressed up in his dead wife's clothes. The young man was Daniel LaPlante. He was wearing her dress, a blonde wig, and had full makeup on, he was also holding a hatchet, or an axe if you're from the UK. There was a brief struggle, and Daniel was able to escape. Brian was shocked at how Daniel was able to escape from view so easily, and immediately called police. Police arrived at the house, and quickly discovered the writings on the walls were done with ketchup, not blood as the girls first thought, and officers searched the house for any sign of the intruder. After an intense search, one officer found a hidden crawl space behind a cupboard in Annie's bedroom. When the investigator opened the door to the crawl space, he found Daniel curled up inside, still wearing the wig and dress. Daniel was quickly arrested, and officers removed the wig from his head, although out of kindness, they let him keep the dress on. Then police searched the Andrews property thoroughly. To the Andrews horror, they realized Daniel had been living inside the walls of their home for months. He had tunneled between the walls to different parts of the house, and he had made peepholes in several rooms, so he could spy on Annie whichever room she was in. God knows what Daniel was planning, dressed up in their dead mother's clothing and wielding an axe. The girls looked like they had a lucky escape. Daniel was placed in a youth institution for the home invasion, but he wouldn't even spend a year inside, and in October 1987, he was released on bail, back into society. Daniel was charged with kidnapping, armed assault in a dwelling, breaking and entering, larceny of more than $100, and malicious destruction of property. On December 11, 1987, he was due to appear at the Middlesex Superior Court, but this would not come to be, Daniel had other plans. It didn't take him long before he was back to his old way of life, breaking into people's homes. Throughout October and November in 1987, he broke into several properties, again stealing valuables, and moving furniture around the houses to mess with people's heads. In one of these burglaries, he managed to obtain two handguns. Now Daniel was more dangerous than ever, and things would only escalate from here. On December 1, 1987, Daniel broke into the Gustafson family home, which was around half a mile from where Daniel lived. He was confronted by Priscilla Gustafson, and her two children, Abigail 7, and William 5. Daniel immediately bound and gagged Priscilla, then the sick bastard forced himself upon her, then put a pillow over her face, and shot her twice in the head. The whole time her five-year-old son William was watching. He then drowned William in the bathtub upstairs, and when Abigail returned home from school, he drowned her in the downstairs bathtub. Priscilla's husband Andrew, who was a lawyer in a nearby town, had just closed a big real estate deal that day, and was trying to get in contact with his wife, to get a babysitter so they could go out to dinner and celebrate. When he couldn't get hold of her, he became increasingly worried, and drove to their house. When he got home, he could see Priscilla's car sitting on the driveway, but the house was eerily dark. When he entered the home, he found his wife, who was 33 years old and three months pregnant, dead in the bedroom. She had been shot twice in the head, and it was evident that the killer had forced himself upon her. Andrew went into the kitchen and called police, he said he was too scared to go and search for his two children, as he couldn't bear the thought of finding them dead. When police arrived, Andrew sat in one of their patrol cars while police searched the property. 
Within minutes, an officer came out and told him that his children were dead, they had been drowned. Police found two two caliber bullet casings, an open, untouched can of beer, and semen stains on the bed. They also discovered shoe prints in a flower bed outside the home. Officers made a list of likely suspects in the area, and given Daniel's history of burglary and the Andrews home invasion, he was put on that list. The following day, December 2nd, police questioned Daniel, finding him at the Townsend Public Library. He denied any involvement in the murders, telling the police he had been at home watching TV most of the day, and then attended his six-year-old niece's birthday party. Other than their suspicions, they didn't have any hard evidence linking Daniel to the murders yet. But later that same day, police would go to Daniel's house to question him again. As police approached Daniel's home, he was standing on the porch, and upon seeing officers, he turned and fled into nearby woods. Police then searched his home and found several items which would connect Daniel to the murder of Priscilla and her children. The gun used to shoot Priscilla was found in the glove box of Daniel's father's car, and two two-caliber gun shells were found that matched the two that were found at the Gustafson home. A pair of men's running shoes were found that matched the footprint that was left in the flower bed. A cordless phone that was stolen from the Gustafsons was also found. They also found a sock with saliva on it, police believed it was used to gag Priscilla. An APB was put out for Daniel, which involved over 50 officers searching for him. Not being the criminal mastermind, Daniel continued his criminal activity, and he kidnapped a woman at gunpoint, forcing her to drive him around in her Volkswagen van. Luckily, she managed to escape on foot and contacted police, telling them that Daniel was driving around in her van. There were other sightings of Daniel that were reported to police, and on the 3rd of December, police found him hiding in a dumpster in Iyer, Massachusetts. He was still armed with one of the stolen guns, which he had hidden in his underwear. He was charged with the murder of Priscilla and her children, plus a range of other charges related to crimes he committed whilst on the run from police. He also had the charges relating to the Andrews home invasion. The trial began in October 1988, and after a psychiatric evaluation, Daniel was deemed fit to stand trial, and although he was a minor at the time of the offense, the judge ruled he would be tried as an adult. Daniel pleaded not guilty, but the evidence against him was overwhelming, and after deliberating for five hours, the jury found him guilty of the murders, and the judge sentenced him to three life sentences without parole. In 2013, Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled anyone who committed murder, that was under the age of 18 years, could not be sentenced to life without parole, as it was unconstitutional. Yeah, killing women and children is unconstitutional as well, but Daniel didn't give two fucks about the law then did he? Daniel was resentenced to three life sentences, with the possibility of parole after 45 years, and although I think he should be kept in for life, respect to the judge for giving him such a long sentence. Even after 45 years, I can't see them letting the child-killing scum loose. He is currently incarcerated at MCI Norfolk Prison in Norfolk, Massachusetts. 30 years ago, a pregnant mother and her two young children were brutally murdered. Now because of a recent Supreme Court ruling, their killer is hoping for a shot at parole. Our Bob Ward has been following this case very closely. He joins us live tonight, and Bob, that killer made his case for release today. He did, and he issued an apology, but for the families of the victims in this case, it was a hollow apology. The family members are urging the judge to keep this sentence exactly the way it is right now so that this guy stays right where he is, in prison. I, I do not have the words to fully express my profound sorrow, but I am truly sorry for the harm that I've caused. An apology in open court from Daniel LaPlante, the man convicted for killing Priscilla Gustafson and her two young children in their Townsend home in 1987. LaPlante is asking a judge to restructure his three consecutive life no parole sentences, a move that would make him eligible for parole, eligible for early release this year. From the very essence of who I am, the depth of my soul, I am sorry. Daniel LaPlante was 17 at the time of these murders. Recent high court rulings citing the development of juvenile brains outlawed life no parole for teen killers like LaPlante and paved the way for this hearing. 
but a forensic psychiatrist testified the development of LaPlante's teenage brain had nothing to do with these brutal murders. This, he said, was the work of a cold-blooded killer. As he said to me, he wanted his needs to be met and did carry out what he intended to do, is to kill an entire family, and he went about it in a very systematic fashion. The victim's family is urging the judge to ignore LaPlante's plea for a reduced sentence. Do not believe that he is rehabilitated and worthy of parole. He is a menace and a threat to society. LaPlante is now 46 years old. If the judge leaves the sentence just the way it is right now, he won't be eligible for parole for another 15 years when he is 62 years old. The judge will issue her ruling tomorrow. Live in Woburn, I'm Bob Ward. I did have a small amount of sympathy for Daniel. It can't have been easy having the upbringing that he had, being abused by everyone that's supposed to be helping you. But after the sick twisted bastard killed a pregnant woman and then drowned two innocent little children with his own bare hands, I feel nothing but anger towards him. I hope he never sees the outside of prison walls again, and that he meets his maker, sooner rather than later. What do you all think, am I being too harsh thinking this way, let me know in the comment section down below. Thanks so much for watching, if you found the video interesting, please give it a like, as it helps to get the video seen, and consider subscribing if true crime is your thing, as I post true crime videos every week. See you in the next video.